Um, thank you for having us today. It's my pleasure to share a little bit about our journey uh, along this Ebola readiness project that we've been so involved with. Um, it's, it's certainly been a, a learning endeavor for all of us. And, um, you know, I remember in the 1990s, how many of you saw that movie outbreak with Dustin Hoffman in the 90s? And I never really dreamed I'd be really sort of participating in what this meant for uh, the United States. So it's been kind of an interesting journey to think about that. Uh, first of all, a little bit about us. Um, you probably heard in the, in the bios, I oversee regional Providence Healthcare. So it's Stevens County and Spokane County, not just the, the two hospitals that you're familiar with, Holy Family and Sacred Heart, but also the medical group and our critical access hospitals. So a few of my perspectives that I'll be sharing here with you this morning um, or this afternoon have to do with sort of our own Providence Healthcare uh, response and, and readiness with us. But just um, to kind of get started, when you think about Providence Healthcare and specifically Sacred Heart, you think about that quaternary facility that pretty much does everything. You think about transplants and you think about all this terrific cardiovascular work that we do, and you think about stem cell transplants, and this, this very high technology. And yes, we've used isolation techniques for years and years and years and years, but nothing like this. And so um, as this sort of happened, we had to pause and say, oh gosh, we really need to look at what we do, because are we a highly reliable system when it comes to this kind of isolation technique? And not unlike other hospitals, it was our answer to ourselves was we're not where we need to be and we're not where we want to be. And realistically, looking at the science, we really never believed we would get an Ebola patient. We're still not sure we'll ever get one. But in, in order to really fulfill our mission and who we are and protect our community and protect our healthcare workers, we knew that we had to get good at this. Because, as Dr. Lindquist said, what's the next one? And so as we sort of contemplated what we've, what we've been through the last few years, uh, most recently was just a few years ago, H1N1. And um, the response to that, we had people die and were very, very, very sick from that in our ICUs, on um, ECMO for it. Uh, it was really incredible. And for healthcare workers, seeing patients that were in their 40s and 50s dying of this, was pretty incredible. And yet, most of the public really didn't think about that being the scary thing. Um, like Ebola is thought about being the really scary thing. And so um, we are very committed to being a center, the treatment center, an assessment center for our region too, and doing this really well, not only for our community, but for our healthcare workers. We want to keep them safe, but we want to serve in the way that we've served other specialties um, before. So on we go. So you're probably familiar a little bit with our mission and vision because we are part of the Sisters of Providence system. Part of what we do is take care of the poor and vulnerable. So taking care of Ebola or H1N1 or the next waterfowl uh, pathogen is really part of what we do. We're committed to taking care of patients. That's what we got in this thing for, and that's what we continue to do. But knowing that and feeling that, sometimes it's a little different if you're um, a nursing couple, you both work in an ICU and you have little children and you're both going to be taking care of highly uh, patients at high risk. That gives you pause. And and what do you do about that? What's the, what's the discernment about how do you how do you keep people safe and fulfill your mission? And how do you make it work for, for everyone? Um, Dr. Lindquist mentioned a little bit about the AIDS um, crisis when that was happening in the early 80s. And I remember I was working at Deaconess Hospital at the time, and we got their first patient, and it was 1984. And there were certainly um, other, other things that, that made it more challenging even to get staff or physicians to participate in the care of these patients. The science wasn't that advanced yet. We didn't know a lot about it. We didn't know, uh, we weren't confident in the science perhaps. And it was very difficult for some people to agree to take care of it because they had ethical and moral issues with the people that were being diagnosed with AIDS, um, whether they were homosexuals or not. And so it made it very, very challenging. But we did see some of that come up this time as well. And it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's, 
probably the best thing we did was to pro try to keep the facts and the fiction clear. You know, what are the facts? What is the science? Um, let's really um, embrace what we profess ourselves to be, and that's healthcare professionals, and understand that. Much easier said than done, though. But um, anyway, so that's a little bit of a part of our journey. So, of course, everybody's going to recognize these pictures, and I don't have to tell you anybody who's in this, but just uh, from a perspective of sort of living in the moment here as things were sort of, sort of starting to evolve. Um, September 26, Duncan goes to Texas Presbyterian Health Hospital in Dallas with a fever and tells a nurse he's been to Liberia. He's sent home with antibiotics and Tylenol. September 28, he returns to the hospital in an ambulance and is isolated. September 30th, the CDC confirms that a patient who would be later identified as Duncan has been diagnosed with Ebola on U.S. soil. That could have happened anywhere else. October 6, there's a freelance American cameraman who contracted um, Ebola in West Africa and arrives at Nebraska uh, Medical Center. October 8, Duncan dies at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital. Now just a little aside, there's 10 of us here from Sacred Heart and Holy Family and Colville that are in Dallas right then. We were down there um, for our Nursing Excellence Conference at the time. So, you know, imagine 8,000 nurses all together in Dallas thinking about, talking about, um, feeling, you know, um, support for Texas Presbyterian because we know that could have been here, it could have been Seattle, it could have been anywhere and kind of what they were going through. But also getting calls from our families up here that we think you should come home, it's not safe to be in Dallas. And it's like, no, I think we're okay. But, um, but anyway, it just kind of was another way to really sort of more personalize what was really happening, what people were going through, and, and how people were reacting to that kind of information. Then October 12th happened, and um, this I think was another really big, big hard thing to swallow for healthcare workers because it was when a um, nurse fan was diagnosed with having the Ebola virus. And um, it was a couple weeks later that she was declared virus free. So that really brought it home because nobody really knew what happened, why did she get it? Um, and they weren't talking and no, you know, you just don't know what's really going on. Is it, was it really a breach? And the word breach really um, was something that, that really resonated through our hospitals too. Well, what does breach mean? And that, that sounds so much more than, well, maybe, you know, maybe they didn't do this one piece right or maybe they didn't off right or but breach sounds almost criminal doesn't it when you hear that word so it, it was it was kind of something that sort of shook people kind of to the core about is the science correct in terms of all this done and doffing and how are we going to be protected and then of course just um, shortly thereafter Amber Vinson was also diagnosed with, with uh, Ebola and then later again um, declared virus free so it, it the reality really kind of hit our healthcare workers and we knew we really had to, to do something. So this was what was happening everywhere, not just in hospitals, but for, for those of us in leadership positions, it's kind of, you know, what do you do first? So you definitely get into that sort of incident command mode where you assemble your, your groups and you try to determine what are the things that we need to do first. And, and um, you know, the, there was so much anxiety around donning and doffing in the supplies that that was almost its own sort of galaxy of, of getting ready and where's our stuff and, and those kinds of things. And so, you know, at this point, um, we're getting organized internally, but it was just so helpful with Dr. Joel McCullough from the Regional Health District and Dr. Lynn Quist uh, from the Department of Health because we were kind of ramping through things and um, Emory University, I, you know, Mary Jo's had the opportunity to go down there and see their unit and talk with their healthcare providers down there, which is fantastic. But they were really helpful to us as well in really getting our journey started and really getting into the particulars of what we really needed to do. The, the thing like everything else, though, when there's kind of a crisis or chaos, and depending on who you are and how you handle those things, everybody wanted to control this. And I wanted to control it. The Providence system wanted to control it. Uh, we were getting lots of advice from others. Um, you know, we were reading lots. We're, you know, where do most people go if they want information? 
Google, right? And there's lots of junk on, on there that you just don't even want to know about. But one of the one of the things that we really learned is that, okay, we're going to make a decision and stick to it. What are we going to start with for our policies and procedures? And we have a lot of respect, respect for Emory and the credibility that Emory had. And don't tell my bosses, but even though the system was telling telling us, you're going to do it this way, we did it the Emory way here. And we're not sorry we did it the Emory way here either. We had to put a stake in the ground because we felt like we needed to move ahead. So that was really helpful. The second really great piece that was helpful, though, is when the Department of Health provided us this really great cross-functional checklist. And um, typically in hospitals, if you look at our policies and procedures, they're pretty isolated. This is how you put the IV catheter in, right? You know, not how the whole system sort of works together, so you can get to the point of putting the IV in, but this is how you put the IV in. We're very technical and very specific. And the checklist that we were provided uh, was very cross-functional in the way it served um, the topic element. So, for instance, you know, the ambulatory response to screen and um, um, assess symptoms. It was all put together, so all the varieties of people that might have contact with that patient just boom, 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 here was the checklist. So you could use the checklist as a gap assessment, and you could see, do we do this? Yes, check, done. Ooh, maybe we don't do the next one. Let's fill that gap and let's move that on. So it was everything from before they ever got to your hospital to the management of the deceased, which, which actually was one of the most difficult pieces to get put together. And thanks to our health district partners here, that got put together. But you wouldn't think that would be that difficult until you think about it. And if a patient has had a lot of blood body fluid, um, body fluids to manage and the patient has expired, who's going to want to take that patient and deal with that part too? So that's a big decision for a funeral home to make is do we want to participate in this? Is this a social responsibility of ours or not? So it was, it was really, really interesting. The travel screening, um, um, Dr. Lindquist mentioned that a little bit too. And you know that was kind of a priceless piece for us because it really kept the information and the, um, the um, focus right in everybody's sort of assessment phase, right kind of in your face. And at the beginning, you know, being overzealous, we had every travel history and screen that you could imagine. And one of our first sort of, we think we have one case is, positive travel history, positive for fever, but the travel history wasn't for West Africa, it was for Saudi Arabia. So there, and that's the disconnect because of MERS. So MERS was part of what our travel screening piece was all about. And it's important to know about that too, but we headed down the wrong path because everybody was so concerned about Ebola. This patient that potentially could have had MERS was heading down the Ebola track for a workup. So that was, that was kind of an interesting process. In the beginning, too, before all of these wonderful monitoring and surveillance activities got into place, you know, no one knew, and we were sort of expecting this surprise patient, too. So it was, it was really kind of on top of mind, and I think the travel screen really helped us. Yes, they got a positive screen, but no, they don't have a fever. That was really helpful, you know, and, and then you got kind of in a group for that. Many of you probably know we're also, um, we also have psychiatry at Sacred Heart. So I have to say, we have a lot of patients that came in with psychiatric and mental health issues that came in and said, I have Ebola. And then everybody's scared and they're like, they just told me they have Ebola. You know, not really. But the fact of the matter is it just sort of raised that other level of concern. Another patient was in Seattle and happened to be at a conference, had lunch with a couple of people that just came from Africa not West Africa. They just had lunch with them. Those other people were asymptomatic. The person came back to Spokane, got the flu, in the ED with the fever, and I think I have Ebola. So you kind of see how one thing leads to another, but you can, you can really never, uh, you have to take everything at face value and say, okay, let's try to keep a clear mind, take a deep breath, and let's look at the whole picture here. So uh, we've, we've learned a lot along the way um, so far with this. So where's our stuff? You know, in a world that goes to Amazon.com and gets their delivery the next day or maybe in two days, it's pretty hard when you're looking for different kinds of lengths of gloves or special disposable hoods and they say, 
you're not going to get any for four months. And it's like, what? Because we were competing with the whole country in trying to get some of the PPE supplies that, that we really wanted. And this was really challenging and to prepare the PAR levels, our inventory levels for what we needed in all these supplies is pretty significant. We, you know, at first we wanted like seven days, so we thought, well, this is this is the good part about being a system, right? We got this buying power, and we're going to have access to these vendors that are going to give us the stuff that maybe everybody else might not get, but boy, we're going to get it. Ha ha! That didn't happen either, and we really were assisted again locally and with, with the state for some trying to get either inventory that they had or a queue up for accessing inventory from another region or higher on the list to get the supplies because we're going to be a treatment facility. But this was kind of a big learning for us because we're in the United States doesn't mean you could just get anything you want. Now subsequent to that, what also we learned was that because the United States was hoarding all of these things, all of this very, very important stuff, the people that really needed it in West Africa they couldn't ever be needed. And they were the people that really needed it the most um, for obvious reasons. So it was really kind of a, a good lesson learned. It was also a good lesson learned about workarounds. And so we knew we couldn't get the appropriate shoe covers that were the healthcare style. So we thought, okay, we're going to get Crocs, right? You can wipe them off, you can clean them, you know, um, disinfect the whole thing according to the process. So Trying to get Crocs in the state of Washington in the month of November was impossible. The state of Alaska bought them all. <laughs> so it's like, okay, we're going to get these other shoes from Walmart and we'll just throw them away. And so, you know, you work around that kind of thing. But it really was a good demonstration of, of what happens when people get frantic. And, and um, you know, definitely in, in one of those things that as I look through my career that I just never expected to experience, but it does make the case for readiness and a system that works really well. And this state is definitely a leader within that. So certainly um, I talked a little bit about this checklist, but here in um, at Sacred Heart, we really uh, kind of took the checklist then we got our steering committee together. And there's a lot of people involved with this. So the obvious ones, certainly nursing, emergency department, ICU, pediatric ICU, but our infection prevention people, our educators, we had to have people teach others on donning and doffing, teach others on how to be observers, um, teach others on a variety of things, including how to document in our new electronic health record. Environmental services plays a big role not only in room cleaning or terminal cleans, but in waste management as well. Our laboratory, you know, I've been involved here for, for many years, but I had never been as involved with our microbiology department as I have the last five months. And I'm here to tell you I'm, I'm so impressed with our microbiology department. We have a biosafety lab level three here, and we already handle a lot of very, very um, challenging viruses and bacteria that um, no one else in the region, and I mean the region in the Northwest, handles. So we're very lucky that way. And uh, we're, we were very complimented by the CDC when they did our site visit that Mary Jo is going to talk with you about, about our laboratory services. Um, Dr. Joel McCullough from the Regional Health District was on our steering committee. Our safety and security people were here. And what I hadn't really thought about was making sure that waste and specimens were secure. So, you know, somebody couldn't take it with other intentions to use as something from a criminal act. We, we really never thought about that kind of thing. We're just thinking about protecting people from it. And I guess you have to think about, you know, some of the more darker um, acts as well. Communications, um, you know, you saw all the media attention on CNN and, and all of those kinds of things. And um, certainly we have now a media kit prepared if and when we have to deal with a special pathogen like Ebola. Our MD physician advisors were, were priceless, as, our, as were our anesthesiologists, supply chain people, and Tony Hill, uh, if you ever meet that guy, he is just, he's just done an amazing job for us in really trying to put together something that's easy to use, um, workarounds that we needed because we couldn't get supplies, and really accessing our system to get things. And then employee health all the things that you have to manage for a potential exposure or an exposure for our own employees. So we worked on our gap analysis, got our to-do list together, and away we went and uh, proceeded towards um, a survey later with the 
CDC. Lessons learned for me as a leader here, I just kind of wanted to share a few of these things. Um, decisions. You know, you're getting a lot of advice and direction from a variety of people, so decisions. My advice, lesson learned, is to make one. Ours was to use the Emory policies and procedures. You know, put a, you know, put a stake in the ground and say, okay, we're going to do it this way. I know. We're going to do it this way. And that's, that was really something at the beginning that was really important for us to do. Local support, a group thinks together better than individuals, and um, use the resources that you have because they're great. Um, competing for supplies, uh, being creative really kind of helped us a lot. For some of our practice sessions, we actually used our orthosurgical hoods because we didn't have the right disposable hoods to go under the proper hoods. So we practiced with something that we could kind of substitute so people could at least get kind of a feel for it. And then probably lastly and most importantly is the long-term approach. One of the things that was feared here as in many communities is if we get an Ebola patient or something high risk like that, is it going to scare people away from using the rest of our services? Now, there's lots of realities that come with that. It's, you know, I'm going to have my baby at Sacred Heart, but I prefer they're going to have this kind of patient there. Should I have my baby at Sacred Heart? No. Yes, because we're going to keep, we're going to protect the community by doing this well. You know, the critical services that we do for, you know, heart or ambulance trauma level three level 4 NICU, this needs all to be continued and we need to make sure to keep our community safe by being good at these kinds of things. We do not want to disrupt critical services by being a treatment facility. We will not be doing that. And we'll have to, on an ongoing basis, continue to educate our community about what we're doing in our hospitals, what we're doing in our community to keep it safe, and what we're doing to continue to provide those critical services that patients expect and need uh, from us. So measuring success. This was kind of one of the biggest things that made me nervous because we, even when we got all of our checklists done and we started doing the drills, it's like you needed to be validated. Let's have someone who's done this before come in and look at us and make sure that we're doing things the right way. Because then how can you really be assured that everything is okay? How can you confidently look in the eyes of the nurse that's going to be in that room with that patient and say, fine. So it was really important for us to have that CDC visit. And um, there was a whole team from uh, the Department of Health, our local regional health district, as well as the CDC that came in, I think it was November or December, and we did a full-on walkthrough, like a patient tracer, if you will, from the time that a patient could arrive to the time that a patient could um, to lead us. And I was so gratified by minimum findings. They did have some suggestions, but they were very, very pleased with what, what we had done to date, and it had only been a couple of months since we started this whole journey. So that was really helpful, and it was also nice to put eyes on the people that you knew that if you did get a patient in your facility, that were going to be here in a heartbeat to help and guide the process all the way through. So, so that was really helpful, not only for me as a leader, but for the staff that would be kind of on the front lines with our patients in giving their care. Drills, improvement plans, and corrective action plans to be better and to create a highly reliable system for dealing with these kinds of pathogens is important to us and is something that we'll be carrying forward uh, from here forward. So I think I'll let Mary Jo kind of talk about the details and then we'll take questions at the end of her um, presentation for our own readiness journey. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. and as. Part of my talk is navigating readiness, but in reality, it's sustaining readiness. And I was on a conference call, maybe some of, of others of you were earlier this week with Nebraska. And they have been ready for 10 years. It was nine years before they received their first patient. Emory was 14 years before they received their first patient. So they sustained that readiness all that time. We've been six months and I'm tired. So I'm not really sure if I can go that long. Emory had 72 hours before their first patient arrived. So they, they felt lucky that they had noticed they had drilled the week before, so they felt very comfortable with that. So we went through countless drafts of our policies and procedures, and we're still updating those. Most of it was related to PPE. Um, as Peg said, that we utilized what Emory was putting out, their policies and procedures, 
but they were changing. And in those earlier days in October, the CDC was really coming out almost daily with updates to PPE, to policies, to procedures. So trying to, to catch up and stay even with them was a big challenge for us. We, um, I had the opportunity to visit Emory in February to hear firsthand their experiences. And while I was there, their third patient, one of the physicians who had been a patient there for 42 days, was back for a follow-up visit. Um, and it was fascinating listening to him. But what was interesting was the after effects that he was having. He lost vision in one eye. He actually was readmitted to Emory. Um, they thought maybe a recurrence of the virus, but it wasn't. Um, he does not recall how he would have contracted the disease. He doesn't recall any breach in PPE. Um, he has no idea, but he fully recovered. He was with them for 42 days, um, was on dialysis, was on a ventilator. So all of our worst case scenario um, fears he experienced there. But um, fascinating listening to him talk. I know that there'll be AMR here later talking about transport of the patients, but we really had a good working relationship with our local EMS system. And when the CDC was here in December, they were very impressed um, that AMR was represented and talked to them about um, their, ready, their readiness for this. So as, as it stands right now, all potential Ebola patients from other facilities will be a direct admit to the ICU. What that means is they will stop at our emergency department, we have space for them to go, the ICU staff will go down in PPE with a bed and pick the patient up in the emergency department. So that um, really eliminates the need for the patient to take up a room in the ED, we would have prep time, we know the patient would be coming, hopefully this would be a patient that is known in the community that we were monitoring in the first place. So patients um, arriving via EMS would be screened by the ambulance service prior to arrival, and they would take all necessary precautions. Currently, all of our emergency department staff is trained in PPE. They're trained in caring for those patients because they all rotate through the triage nurse um, position down there. So they're asking the screening questions, responding appropriately. One of the lessons from the CDC they asked us about, and maybe these screening questions will change, is we have valet staff who when patients arrive at the front door in a couple different areas in the hospital, not necessarily the ED, but they're seeking medical assistance. Um, they recommended that we have the valet staff ask those same screening questions. Um, in the ED, we've identified the rooms for isolating those patients. Staffing of the care team after the Texas health situation, there really was extreme concern from the ICU staff over their safety. A lot of discussion in report and on breaks and staff saying, well, I have little kids and you don't, so you should take care of the patients. And other staff saying, well, I have grandchildren, so I don't want to take care of them. Um, so much, much discussion with that. And I was real clear with Peg early on before we even took on this challenge is I wouldn't accept those patients in the ICU unless I knew our staff and our other patients would be safe. That was our primary concern. We had conversations with our ethics committee about refusing to care for these patients. I'm very, very lucky in the ICU. I have staff that have been there 20, 30 years working in the ICU and many of them cared for patients during the HIV AIDS in the 80s. And they recall that. And those same decisions, same discussions came up. I have staff that will say, that volunteered for the team, they'd rather care for the known than the unknown that come in the door, the patients we get from under the bridge or on the street that we don't have a diagnosis for. This way we know we we're protected as soon as they come in the door. Um, we did have a call go out for volunteers for the team. Um, because of the concerns people had, I wasn't going to force staff to take care of these patients. Um, ultimately, because it's our mission, because it's a, it's a patient population we're going to provide care for, that Providence has made that decision, we'll have further discussions with um, evolving our team. So 24 staff did step up. 
Most after word went out that the management team of the unit, myself included, were being trained for this. Most of the staff in the ICU forget that I used to be an ICU bedside nurse. And if they see me come out of a room now, they ask, did I touch anything? Did I break anything? What was I doing in there? <laughs> so, but they were more than happy to let me step up and take care of these Ebola patients. And when we had a false alarm, I think it was the, the lady that had been on the west side for the conference. Uh, myself and an assistant nurse manager were going to take care of her. We were hoping other staff would step up, or it could have been a long seven days, eight days, 21 days that we were caring for her. I did have two staff that volunteered to the, for the team, but I eliminated them because they were two staff who refused to get the influenza vaccine. And it just mystified me that they would care for the Ebola patients, but yet wouldn't take the vaccine. And I didn't want them to become symptomatic with the flu, and then are we mistaking that for Ebola? So I hadn't advertised that before that I would eliminate those people because then I thought more people wouldn't get the flu vaccine. So I didn't make that known <laughs> up front. We do have an on-call list. One of the things that fascinated me when I was at Emory was since 2001, they've had staff on call 24-7, 365. And my first thought was, oh my gosh, what would Peg say about our budget if we did that? Um, but we do have an on-call list that we initiate if there's a patient in the community identified at some risk. Not the low risk, but the some risk. And we've activated that, I want to say twice since October. And we've had great response from our, our team signing up for those shifts. We developed the competencies for PPE, patient care, lab procedures, environmental services, management waste. And again, it is the bedside nurse and that care team who is doing most of this. They are doing the cleaning in the rooms. They are um, bundling up the waste. They are mopping the floors. They are doing all of that. Um, they are drawing the blood. They are running ISTAT tests. So most of that will be in the room. All of our critical care intensivists were trained on PPE and the telehealth e-stethoscopes. And I have a picture of the telehealth. Now the e-stethoscopes are a fascinating piece of equipment. So the nurse in the room can put the bell of the stethoscope anywhere on the patient. The physician outside of the room just has the ears in and they can hear whatever that nurse, where that bell is. So now they want them for every patient in the ICU so they don't have to go in the rooms of any of our patients, I guess. That's their thought on that. So this is the telehealth machine that's provided, that PHNS provided to us. And it's not a great picture, but on top there is a camera. And when we were practicing with this, we were on the third floor of the doctor's building over there. And we were able to aim that camera right in front of Providence Auditorium. There's a bus stop. And we could see the name tag of the bus driver of the local STA. We didn't know he was being watched, but we could, it was that clear of picture. So this would be uh, positioned in the patient's room, and the physician can be outside of the room directing via a laptop how they're going to assess their patient. It does not mean the physician won't go in our room. Our anesthesiology physicians have really stepped up. They would be the ones putting lines in our patients. If the patients needed to be intubated, they would be the ones doing the intubation. Our goal is to limit the number of people that would go in the room. So 2 South, which is our adult ICU, was identified as the unit the patients would be admitted to. We currently have four negative airflow rooms on that unit, for our, which we've used for TB in the past. They're connected by a hopper room, so it's a very nice flow to go from one room where the patient would be cared for through the hopper room into the second room without going out into the hallway and that's where the waste would be stored and that's where the doffing of the PPE would take place. We also have two ante rooms connected to those rooms where we can store equipment. Um, we're adding toilets to those two rooms. Currently in the ICU, we don't have toilets in our rooms. Our thought is if someone can get up to the toilet, they can transfer out of ICU. I mean, that's just, we just don't have toilets, but we will be adding those. Our employee health department um, really stepped up, did a nice job about monitoring our personnel and managing those exposures. So if we would have a patient, there is a nurse, it's a team of three that we would have. One nurse assigned to the ante room, stationed, monitoring entry of personnel into the room, watching people don their PPE, names are kept on a log, they're faxed to the employee health daily, 
Um, our employee health developed a SharePoint website where the staff are expected to enter their body temperature response to sim excuse me, symptom questions. This would go on for 21 days past their last interaction with that patient. They would also be called if for some reason it's not entered. So employee health would be monitoring that. If they did not have access to that website, they could call into a line and employee health would enter, enter those symptoms for them. So again, it's done the first day of contact with the patient. Um, anytime anybody in the lab or waste of our EBS staff, so it's not just nursing staff we're talking about, anybody who provided any type of care for this patient. Again, twice daily through the end of the 21st day. EHS was uh, providing our um, caregivers, environmental services staff, lab staff, a kit that had a thermometer in, phone um, numbers, how to access the website, and the log. We do have a separate lab area set up in our current lab. Volunteers also stepped up to man that lab. We did ISTAT training for all of the ICU staff. We had a procedure written for transport of specimens. This is, for all transparency, uh, one of our false alarm cases came into the ED and they tubed the blood to the lab, which would have shut down our entire tube system and our entire hospital had there been a true Ebola patient. Right now, the only way to transport those are in a container that no way, no how could fit into our um, tube system. Management of waste, it was interesting at Emory because they have a huge autoclave, I mean huge. But it's a lot of management of that autoclave by the staff in testing temperatures and doing a whole QC every day. So Mike Charles, our Director of Environmental Services, worked with Stericycle, which is our local waste management, for the agreement of the transport of the waste. So that is how our waste is transported. Uh, we developed the procedure um, for waste disposal in the toilets, including the rinsing with bleach, so our local water district was made aware of that and signed off on that as well. We built a secure area at the street level for waste storage. Again, as Peg had said, we wanted to make sure that none of our waste was um, absconded with by people for nefarious reasons. So lessons learned from our CDC visit. Our, our shrouds we had for our PAPRs, or our powered air purifiers, didn't allow for the removal of CO2. So they noted quickly that the RN would slowly pass out and die had we continued with those shrouds. So poor Brooke, who was our nurse that day, that's not what we wanted to happen to her. We had some carpeting at the entrance of our emergency department that should be removed and will be replaced with non-porous flooring. We needed a specific area for EMS to doff their PPE and decontaminate the truck, and they're using our decon room in the ED. They had high praise for the incorporation of our ethics, our bioethicists, into the plan. They hadn't really seen that before to the extent that um, Sacred Heart addressed it. And we had some real questions about these patients as they became very ill. Do we automatically make, make them a no code? Do we intubate them? Do we put them on dialysis or CRRT? You know, what would be the plan? And it really is, no, they're not an automatic do not resuscitate patient. But even at Emory, the recommendation is you do everything up to and including CPR. You're really putting your team at risk if you're not going to go in and attempt CPR on somebody and everybody's trying to put on the correct PPE and you're going to have massive body fluids in there. So it would be a case-by-case -case, um, situation, but our, our staff ethicist, Andy Chapman, did an amazing job. So we are ready, willing, and able. We, this was one of the most, I've been at Sacred Heart a very long time. Um, the way the team stepped up, from October, when we really started our journey to the CDC visit in December, and I know it was in December because it was the day of our annual employee Christmas dinner. And so it's prime rib and turkey and ham, and my first thought when I heard they were coming that day, wait, I'm supposed to carve prime rib. Who's going to take my carving station? And the CDC, I was interested because, oh, this is great. They can have this food. Well, they had to buy it because they're government employees, so they couldn't take free food from us, and I found that fascinating. Thought maybe we'd get a better score if we gave them free food, but they had to pay. Um, but all of our department directors, it truly was what do you need and when do you need it. As Peg mentioned, Tony Hill, 
he actually went to Walmart and bought out, I don't even know how many pairs of shoes of all different sizes that he brought and is now part of our carts that we have here. And they'll continue to go to Walmart and do whatever we need. When we did our first drill, I thought it was very interesting and showed the staff the support of their managers. Every single department manager responded to our drill in support of their staff. So our security manager responded with the security officers. The lab supervisor responded with the lab phlebotomist who came up to collect the specimen. Uh, environmental services, two supervisors came up with their employees who were scrubbing the hall behind the patient as we transported from the emergency department up to the ICU. Very fully engaged. And this was our drill that we did. Our patient was Russ Shear, who's actually our director of performance improvement and quality at the hospital. And those are two of the ICU nurses. So they're ready, we're willing, we're able, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in really six months' time. Peg and I are available for questions. There's a lot we didn't cover. Again, it's the policy is very thick, constantly being revised. <laughs>